Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's time we start with, uh, with the third panel of this conference. So please take your seats. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon again. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Sasha Vandra for organizing this conference because uh, I'm not the only one apparently who believes that uh, such kind of uh, events uh, in which we could discuss uh, what to do uh, in the contemporary difficult security situation and what our appropriate reaction should be. Um, and I have to say that uh, I have been a bit disappointed over the past couple of months uh, that uh, uh, the Czech, uh, better, better said, Prague-based think tanks haven't really produced any, any earth-shattering papers or haven't been really involved in some serious deba public debate about uh, what our strategy should be uh, in the light of uh, what Russia has been doing and what's going on uh, in other places just outside of Europe. So, uh, again, I'm very happy that uh, Sasha Vondra and uh, several institutes decided to, uh, with Wes Mitchell, of course, with SIPA, uh, decided uh, uh, to organize uh, this event uh, so that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, look into uh, this serious stuff about uh, our defense and security uh, in, uh, the, in, in the security environment that uh, is probably the worst or the most negative one since 1989. Uh, I think this is the message everyone should uh, uh, take home that uh, we now live in the most difficult uh, security environment or security situation uh, for the past 25 years at least. Uh, my name is Jan Jeresz. I used to teach at this school and I used to run this little uh, institution uh, within the school, which is the Prague Center for Transatlantic Relations. I'm really happy that uh, uh, Sasha Vandra took over from me. Uh, it's actually a, a great honor. Uh, this panel should be uh, or will be devoted to the US-Czech cooperation in hard power, uh, to maybe say a few words about how I see this topic. Uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, our panelists should uh, primarily talk uh, about how to defend ourselves and how to cooperate in defending our allies in NATO, some of which are more geopolitically exposed than we are. Uh, so what uh, the United States uh, can do and will do and should do uh, to keep defending the, their uh, European allies and what the Czech Republic uh, can do, should do, or even must do to contribute to the joint effort uh, of NATO and uh, uh, the United States in particular. Uh, we have three excellent speakers on the panel. Uh, Wes Mitchell, who is a co-organizer of this event and who is our man in Washington, or perhaps we are his man in Prague, I don't know how to put it. Um, now he's been really indispensable over the past couple of years in keeping Central Europe uh, on radar in, in Washington uh, with uh, policymakers. Uh, our second speaker is uh, uh, Daniel Koštoval, who is actually my boss, so um, I cannot say anything bad about him, uh, but seriously, I mean, he's one of the few people in the Czech Republic who is capable of uh, some serious strategic thinking and capable of actually uh, coming up with uh, innovative ideas of how to proceed in our defense and security policies. And our third speaker is uh, uh, the current uh, uh, chief of our general staff, uh, uh, General Petr Pavel. Uh, he's been uh, in his current position uh, since uh, 2012. Uh, and what is, of course, very important at this moment is that uh, he's the Czech Republic's candidate for the next, for, for next uh, NATO's uh, 
or, or chief of the NATO military committee. Uh, so uh, actually next week there will be a vote in the alliance uh, and uh, we all hope that uh, he, will be, he will be selected as, uh, as uh, NATO's new uh, uh, chairman of the military committee. So without further delay, uh, I would ask our speakers to say what they want to say. All of them will have 10 minutes and afterwards uh, we will have uh, roughly 40 minutes uh, for uh, debate. So please, Wes, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. And it's really great to see so many um, longtime friends in the audience. It's always a very rewarding part of coming to the Czech Republic. When Sasha asked me to talk about hard power in the Czech Republic, um, it, it's not an easy or natural subject, not because hard power is non existent in the Czech Republic, but it's, it doesn't figure as prominently in Czech policy um, or, or the policies of many other Central European small states. Um, as it does in, say, Poland. So it would be a little bit like giving a talk about soft power in Poland. Most of your questions from the Polish audience would have to do with hard power, and so we may have a little bit of that, of that today. But let me just start by saying something. I think I'm, go I'm going to take a little bit different track from some of my American colleagues on the panel earlier, and start by simply saying that the reality is that for most of the past 25 years, hard power hasn't really mattered in the Czech Republic. It, it, it hasn't really mattered for the last 25 years whether the Czech Republic or a lot of other Central European countries had a military at all, or any kind of security policy. That's not to say that you haven't had a military or a security policy. I think you've had a very good military and a very good security policy. But strictly speaking, you haven't needed them in the way that small states in a frontier region have needed militaries and security policies for most of history to protect yourselves from invasion or coercion or extinction. And you haven't needed hard power at the national level because the post-Cold War strategic environment didn't require it. You haven't faced a serious outside military threat, let's say an existential military threat to the Czech Republic for the last 25 years, probably for the first time in the modern history of the Czech state. You've had a security guarantee from the most powerful nation on earth, and you've had the process of European integration to provide a kind of secondary insurance policy. And this has created, not just for the Czech Republic, but I think for all of Central Europe, a kind of Goldilocks moment or a set of conditions that have made Central and Eastern Europe an anomaly, not only in the context of your own history, but compared to most small state allies of the United States in other frontier regions, so in littoral East Asia or the Persian Gulf. And that's allowed you to do certain things. It's allowed the Czech Republic to largely neglect traditional conceptions of power and strategy without worrying about negative consequences to yourselves or to your neighbors. And again, I'm not saying that you haven't thought in those terms, but you haven't existentially needed that in the way that your predecessor, the Czech state of the interwar period, had to deal with those things. It's allowed the Czech Republic to focus inwardly on economic growth and not worry about the normal business of national survival, geopolitics, war, that has been the preoccupation of most small states in Central Europe for most of history. And over time, I think that's encouraged a view that Central Europe, certainly the Czech Republic, can look a lot like the rest of the EU, the mainstream EU approach to hard power. So as a result of that, defense budgets in Central Europe have atrophied over the last several years, anywhere between less than 1% to 1.5% of, of GDP over the last decade or so compared to U.S. allies in other frontier regions that are spending three, four, five, in some cases nine or ten percent of GDP, um, it, it's, you, you haven't had that here. And I, I think you've had an environment that hasn't required it. And I think in some Central European states, that apathy has been reinforced culturally or socially by national cultures that don't strongly favor uh, military resistance or by geography. Um, Bismarck famously said of the Bohemian uh, highland that it was the most defensible piece of real estate in Europe. And if you live in very protective geography, you don't have the threat perception that a country like Poland uh, on the north central European plain has. Uh, vulnerability breeds uh, a deeper threat perception. So under those conditions, I think it's been perfectly logical behavior for the Czech Republic to neglect hard power. It hasn't mattered to your own security because you haven't faced threats. It hasn't mattered to your economy because the stability that's required for a favorable investment climate was already provided by the EU and NATO. It hasn't mattered to your public because they probably, like most Western publics, including in the United States, would prefer to spend that money on social programs. 
And it hasn't mattered to your neighbors because NATO was assumed to be largely solvent. It hasn't really mattered to NATO, by the way, because for reasons that Bruce Jackson talked about earlier, small, military, uh, small state militaries are seen as being largely irrelevant. So most Central European states have done what any states facing that set of incentives would do. You've consistently underinvested in defense, and you've deprioritized hard power as a practical policy concern of the state. Again, perfectly logical behavior. My argument today is that the Ukraine war will make it a lot harder for you to continue doing this indefinitely without incurring certain strategic costs to yourselves and to your neighbors. I think that the war in Ukraine has highlighted three big changes to the Central and Eastern European security environment. Number one, Russia has undeniably reemerged as a predator in the Eastern European ecosystem. It's a predator that is persistent, it's well-armed, it's creative, it's determined. It's determined to overthrow the post-Cold War settlement and the rules-based Western system that has allowed the Czech Republic and its neighbors to prosper politically and economically. I think the war has confirmed Russia's emergence as an atavistically revisionist, militarily capable, territorially unsatisfied, and ideologically anti-Western state with the intentions and the capabilities to act on that set of motivations. Ukraine is also not Georgia. Ukraine is the largest and most strategically important state in Eastern Europe. A Russian military adventure in, in the Ukraine signals a significant elevation in Russian strategic ambition and risk acceptance in Moscow's efforts to revise the regional territorial status quo. It also signals a change in the direction of Russian strategic expansion of the post-Cold War era, away from the south and towards the west which traditionally the goal for Russia has been to create a zone of destabilized, co-opted, or subservient small states between itself and the major power centers of Europe. And I think the, one of the things that worries me is that Putin so far has encountered nothing in the responses of Western nations that would dissuade him from using those same tactics to terrorize, destabilize, and rearrange other nations on Europe's eastern frontier, or even move against a Baltic state at some point. Secondly, Russia's predatory behavior is taking forms that are actually very hard to defeat. Russian tactics in Crimea reintroduce limited war, what's known as limited war techniques that went out of style in Western military thinking in the 1960s or 70s. It's basically the use of very small units to achieve limited political objectives that create a territorial fait accompli that's almost impossible for its victim state or for the West to reverse. And the problem of this kind of tactic, tactic against, say, I'll use the example of a Baltic NATO member state, it would be politically and militarily problematic for NATO to, to defend it or deter. It's politically problematic because the limited political objectives of Russian territorial grabs make them difficult for, for NATO to reach a political consensus on the need to use force against it. It's militarily problematic because NATO's current posture is based on defense and depth. It's a posture that leaves Central and Eastern Europe largely undefended in terms of real infrastructure on the assumption that NATO could be mobilized in time to either defend or deter or retake territory. And I think the experience in Ukraine shows that using defense in depth strategy, which is what the Ukrainians have used, simply gives the aggressor what it wants at a rebate. And then it places the onus, the political and military onus of a counteroffensive on the shoulders of the defender. This points to the third big change that Ukraine signifies, which is seri very serious cracks in the US-led security architecture for Central Europe. There have been doubts in this region for a very long time about the political willingness of the United States to remain strategically engaged in, in Central Europe for, for, for a, over the long term. I think what's different after Ukraine is it's not unreasonable to question the ability of the United States to deter attack, an attack on a NATO member state. And, and I don't mean by that that Russia would defeat the United States in a conventional war. I mean that there would never be a conventional war in which for the, United, the United States would bring its greater military assets to bear. The organizing problem on this strategic frontier and other strategic frontiers globally at the moment is that U.S. extended deterrence is breaking down. And this is a problem that will touch the lives of every single person in Europe or uh, uh, democracies and free market economies across the globe in coming years unless it's adequately dealt with because everything we know about the current global economic and political system is based on the credibility of American strategic extended deterrence whether we think about it every day or not. Um, 
limited war is deliberately below the threshold of what NATO was meant to counter. So if you, if you try to use Article 5 to counter what the Russians were doing in Crimea, it's like using a hammer to try to kill a fly. It, it, it's, it's just not a practical method. So by the time a Crimea-style land grab took place in Lithuania, let's say, deterrence has failed. Even the, the, the solution that's being talked about now in NATO of placing Western tripwires in the region doesn't entirely address the problem. I think the, the antidote to limited war is not defense in depth, it's local defense. Forces in theater to counter incursions when and where they occur on the ground, from local states uh, to forestall or evict a limited war uh, type incursion until NATO reinforcements arrive. And this is really different from what people have been talking about in NATO, certainly for my entire career, where countries like the Czech Republic, the, the gospel wisdom is that you need to be developing out of area capabilities to support the United States in Iraq or Afghanistan. That's no longer the case. Some Central European states are responding to the change in the strategic environment by evolving both doctrinally and in their military spending patterns. Poland is a, is a great example of this. Romania, the Baltic states. I think there are some states in the Central European region, however, who, though they face strong uh, incentives to do the same, uh, I think will continue behaving in hard power sense as if the war never happened. Some Central European states are geographically insulated. Some have very cozy commercial and energy relationships with, with the Russian leadership and with, with Vladimir Putin. Um, some, and I think this is particularly true of former Habsburg states, don't have a history of military occupation by Russia prior to the, uh, to the Cold War. And, and I think it's also partly cultural. Um, I think there's also a view in some Central European states that you're too small to matter. But I would argue that even states that don't feel like they're a frontline uh, recipient of Russian aggression have reasons to rethink their approach to hard, hard power after the Ukraine war. I think that their actions in security will matter more than they did before the war. It will matter more for the security of the Czech Republic or other small Central European states, your relationship to hard power. Um, it will matter more for your own security. Uh, your, your frontline recipients of the instability generated by the Ukraine crisis. You lose out disproportionately. You lose out more than my country does if the, the Russians successfully puncture NATO's credibility with a move against a Baltic state. It matters more for your neighbor's security, how you approach security after Ukraine. Um, I think states that neglect security after Ukraine impose greater burdens on their neighbors. When, the, uh, when Slovakia neglects security, it creates vulnerabilities in the military topography of Poland, and it also makes Slovakia less capable of providing aid or reinforcement in the event of attack. It also matters more to your economic growth. International investors don't like wars. Uh, Central European economies have thrived since the 1990s because you're seen as a safe haven in global emerging markets. And your economic growth has assumed a broader region that is stable. The, e the EBRD has put out a report predicting that if the Ukraine crisis continues for additional months, it's been going on for six, six months or so now, that there will be ripples of instability having nothing to do with sanctions. It also matters more for regional political unity. The Poles aren't going to invest in Visegrad if Visegrad does, is not serious about security. For all of these reasons, I think neglecting security won't pay for Central European small states the way that it did before Ukraine. Um, what to do about this it, is a topic unto itself. I'll try to be brief. I think Russia is an opportunistic revisionist. I don't think Russia has any intention or uh, incentive to conduct large-scale conventional military attacks against NATO territory. It wants to achieve the greatest possible gain at the lowest possible cost to itself. So the goal for security in Central and Eastern Europe should simply be to raise the price of revisionism beyond what Russia is willing to pay. It's the same in other frontier regions with small U.S. allies that are facing the same problem of, of, of the breakdown of deterrence at the moment. And I think you can learn from the behavior, the coping mechanisms that small states are using in East Asia against a military resurgent uh, China or the Persian Gulf, moderate Gulf states are using against uh, Iran. One is harnessing the new power of defensive technologies for small states. Uh, U.S. allies in Asia are investing in anti-access uh, area denial, what's called A2AD weapon systems that are cheap and efficient and make it very difficult for China to use limited war techniques to grab maritime real estate. There's no reason that that concept cannot be applied to land warfare and it's high time that NATO did so. 
A second is the selective development of offensive assets. I'm not primarily referring to the Czech Republic in this case, but a robust defensive structure for the Czech Republic, say investments in A2AD, allow the Poles to spend more of their money on what the Komorovsky Doctrine has in mind, which is creating a conventional local deterrent, and that means offensive assets like those possessed by Finland or Israel or Saudi Arabia. Three, I think you need to pool your risk. Uh, I'm not optimistic about Visegrad defense cooperation in the short term, but I don't think you have a lot of better options. And I think the Gulf states show that small state security alliances can work even if their members have different threat perceptions. The key is that those members of the grouping, like the Czech Republic, who have lower risk, lower threat perception, have to be willing to give ground and sacrifice on non-existential interests to themselves in order to su support the existential needs of an exposed member. Um, four, and finally, don't send mixed signals about your commitment to NATO. I think how the Czech Republic behaves diplomatically is as important as, as what you spend on your military or how you use your military. Um, publicly, I don't want to say ridiculing, but um, publicly doubting the utility of NATO basing on Central European territory, uh, opposing sanctions against Russia, in a few Central European cases, even supporting Russian-led projects that bypass the rest of the region. This just aids Russia's efforts to politically isolate countries like Poland or Romania in the alliance. It doesn't do you any good in the long term. And it signals that, that small states are not willing to fight to, to defend the status quo, no matter what you spend on the military. So I would just close by saying, I think it would be very tempting for a state in the Czech Republic's insulated geographic position to try to take the route of Robert Fico, to go through the motions of NATO membership but shirk your main security obligations and responsibilities. Um, that would probably work for a while, but I think after Ukraine it's no longer a cost-free option for the Czech Republic that it used to be. Um, I think the EU lifestyle is great. I loved the idea earlier that The Economist talked about in, on the panel of uh, Czech Republic basically being a, a small Slavic Germany. If I were Czech, I would want that as well. I think, that, I think that's entirely logical um, desire. But I think it, 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 as, that's fine as long as you realize that you live near a reactivated strategic frontier in a very unstable region. And everything you know about the political and economic stability of your country over the last 25 years depends on our ability to maintain that stability and that you have an obligation, even if you're small, even if you're focused on the economy and you look and act like the EU, and even if you're insulated geographically, you have a responsibility to contribute to that at least as much as the United States. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Wes. It was a great contribution. Uh, this is exactly what we need, looking at uh, defense and security of Central Europe from a broader strategic and historical perspective, which is what uh, you, I know you can do very efficiently. So thank you, thank you. Uh, Daniel, it's your turn now. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Wes, for a provocative uh, contribution. I have to say that uh, living for uh, some years in Washington, uh, I can understand uh, this optics. But I think there is a different story, at least a little bit. I think what, what Wes presented is the optics looking at us um, for last three to five years, but I think there is much deeper um, um, record than, than last five years. And uh, very shortly, um, a reaction to what Wes said and then few comments on hard power and cooperation with the United States. Um, um, I think that uh, we were coming, we, we emerged from the communism with spending 5% GDP or something like that. So uh, usually inadequate spending uh, on force, which was huge and inadequate, inadequate for the Czechoslovakia then. So the key task was to decrease the spending and actually transform the force into something much better in qualitative terms. And, um, and when we were entering NATO, we were spending basically exactly 2% GDP and we had still reasonable numbers. And in terms of strategy and uh, in terms of political will to use um, um, a hard power, we were always backing any single mission which emerged and the United States were in from 1990. 
So in this sense, I don't think, um, I would argue that we were in terms of policy and in terms of uh, strategy, we were able to, to appreciate the, the value added of the hard power and, and, and were willing to uh, politically invest in those decisions. Uh, although the military was not the match of the United States military, but still participating with, with different contributions. Um, I think what's, what's, what's happened in last, let's say five years, maybe six years, was that we, what we have started to do was, and Wes touched on that, um, was creating huge discrepancy between our words and our deeds. So we were still supporting many things, but we were not doing those things. We were saying this is the threat, but we were not investing in, 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 in let's say, hard power. We were decreasing. Um, um, Mr. Vondra or others can, can say more why that happened. Uh, uh, I would argue that, that GDP was not that falling, actually was not falling except maybe one year. But the defense budget and budget of the Ministry of Interior was, was hugely uh, falling. So it was more about political will than about the economic reality. And whether we felt safer than we were, or I don't know, uh, I think it's more complicated. And we, when coming to cooperation, I think, I mean US Czech Republic or US Central Europe, I think what, what maybe United States are today criticizing uh, that maybe we are not much enthusiastic about uh, about doing something which would be visible in the United States because we would be doing those things with the United States. Maybe there is some some uh, there are some routes that United States actually, uh, beginning with the Obama administration, started to signal there is kind of a change of strategy, but this strategy was not really phrased. So we are actually a little bit hesitant what's the strategy of today's United States except saying you, are, uh, you should have better, better burden sharing and you should do more and you are the same way responsible as us. But what's the strategy? And the missile defense is a clear example because the radar issue uh, was, was uh, not success regarding Czech Republic because there were, um, uh, there, there were bad steps on both sides. Of course, we have maybe created the impression that it's not going to pass through the parliament, but it looks like there was, it was a good pretext for the US administration to change, to change the decision, you know. So, I mean, we are in a situation when US strategy for, for NATO and for the world is not totally clear. And I, I understand, I mean, the security environment is collectively changing, so I understand that there is kind of a thinking, but, uh, but uh, I think the hesitancy and unclearness is too big, could be, even in times of qualitative changes in the security environment. And, um, and uh, so, so I think that um, uh, that's some signal, and we have to think what in our geopolitical situation uh, and the security in mind, what we should do. One of the clear, uh, our kind of a steps or policies is to reinforce the regional cooperation and of course uh, do more in terms of the hard, uh, hard power and the hard power is about money. So we, we know that the, there, is, uh, on the, there must be on the table on our side the, the reverse of the, of the trend regarding the defense budget. And I think we started to be on the right track. I mean, we, last year we stopped the fall. Uh, this year was basically the bottom. And we will increase starting with next year. And it's gonna be uh, each year increase between 1.5 billion Czech crowns and more than 2 billion Czech crowns each year to reach 1.4% GDP, GDP by 2020. And of course, at that point, we will think hard how exactly we should augment further, of course, looking at the economy, looking at the security environment, looking at the needs and decisions inside NATO. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we, do, we are trying to do our homework, and I think we have some, uh, we have some uh, uh, 
some results and some uh, some potential for for even better results. Uh, and I hope that there will be narrowing down the gap between the words and deeds on our side. And uh, and besides money, it's also about uh, ability to spend uh, properly uh, and to follow proper uh, strategy and, and policy regarding the spending and, and what forces we are actually building. And here the flexibility and readiness is the, is the, are the key words. And, uh, and uh, I, I hope that General Pavel will have spoke more about what we plan to do and, uh, and what we do with the United States in this regard. Uh, but, but there must be a clear strategy, and, and here United States are as crucial as we are. Because, I mean, just speak about spending without clear vision uh, for what we are spending and, and so on. It's, it's, you can have a large amount of money, but you can spend absolutely stupidly. Uh, so uh, it's a question of the what modernization, what modern technologies, and here we have to discuss together and here we need a partner in the United States to discuss with us, not to just uh, say, spend more and let's meet at another summit. Uh, and here it's a, it's a challenge, huge challenge for our relationship because by definition the relationship is asymmetrical, especially for the hard power stuff. Because for, for what's for us strategic is for United States tactical. I mean, our Air Force right now is, is smaller than the one aircraft carrier. So, I mean, of course, for US President or Minister of Foreign Affairs or, or, uh, or Defense Minister to discuss few planes, which are for us crucial or something like that, is something he's not able to spend in a sec even second because he has on his plate much wider whatever. So. But we should find, a way, find ways how to bridge this asymmetric situation. And I think uh, what's the right way is to have really a, a, a discussion on strategy. Because then we can derive from common strategy what we will do, what you will do, and we can find, together, we can find ourselves together in this mission or that mission, and we will, we will send whatever to Kurds and you will be there, and, and, and then it works. But if there is no clearness and no dialogue on the strategy, then we are falling apart. And, it's, and, and money are not, not, not sufficient uh, parameter to measure how, how good we are together or, uh, or, or individually. Um, so I see this challenge as one of the crucial things um, and, and, you know, speaking about Ukraine, uh, Ukraine just, in our case, Ukraine just uncovered this discrepancy between words and, and, uh, and, and deeds. Uh, the truth is that even le with, with small money, we were doing not bad job because we transformed the military. Uh, Nobody was believing that we will be able to do air policing in the Baltic states having only 12 weapons, and we did it. So there are some positives from budget cuts because we did much better productivity and we found creatively new ways how to, how to put together uh, 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 efficient, let's say, uh, uh, fighting force or the defense capabilities. But of course, money must come back and, and we are working on this. Um, and the issue is, and that's, another, and that's another thing I would like to hear from, from US, maybe, maybe not from us, he's not in the government, but uh, what's with, what is the thinking, you know, US thinking when it comes to the actual international cooperation? Because um, what, what's our experience, at least partially, is that the that United States, even in the field, militarily, they don't, they don't want to rely on anybody else. So, United States are actually, from their side, limiting what we can do with them because nobody is willing to take checks and in incorporate them into something because the United States wants to do everything uh, on their own, with their own people, with nobody sharing anything, you know. So, and that's the problem as well. And this, in last few years, what, what I was able to collect, this trend was actually reinforced on the U.S. side. 
So, so that's another limit we should together, I mean, think about and, and find the ways because how the world became more complicated and uh, uh, United States will need uh, deeper international cooperation than, than, than lower international cooperation. So that's something what's for United States probably also something new and they don't feel comfortable in that regard, but that's something United States must go through some transformation as well, because otherwise we are not together able to adequately react to the security environment. So um, that's, that's some hesitations on our side as well. There are some hesitations on our side as well, knowing and accepting that there, is, there are some deficiencies on our side, but uh, I think we, the, as, as it is in Czech, uh, it's 50% success if you understand what's, what's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, so if those things are, let's say, a little bit fixed, then um, we have very good, I mean, foundation today, uh, what we are good doing together, be it helicopters, be it uh, special operation forces, be it, uh, um, uh, I mean, joint, joint, uh, participation in, in missions. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit hidden because some things are simply not good to publicize. But, uh, but we have a nice bunch of projects and it's not only one project. We don't have one big as missile defense. But we politically are standing in this project and we are vocal on this and we are pushing it always further. Of course, there is nothing from the hard power point of view regarding the uh, missile defense today, what could be in the Czech Republic, especially if we were not able to invest in anything on our side, because I'm convinced personally that if Czech government would be ready to convince 20 billion Czech crowns in 10 years, which is 2 billion per year, which is basically what we spent on weapons, we could have a basis of the, of the, of the interceptors or, or, something, or, or something else, in Czech Republic or radar, we could have it. Because the United States would happily place it in Czech Republic. I mean, so, so that's our fault a little bit as well because we wanted something maybe too much for free. But that's the reality and now we are new, new, maybe new start. So I hope we will have good dialogue to have joint strategy and common understanding and, and to be able to bridge those uh, uh, deficiencies of both sides. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love having a boss who doesn't say just the usual bureaucratic blah blah, but actually is ready to uh, to say uh, some of the more con controversial things in public, which is really refreshing. And now, uh, General, uh, it's your turn. Please go ahead. Thank you. In the military, we are simple people, so my address will also be simple and short, much shorter than previous uh, speakers. Uh, first, I, I would like to say that uh, I really liked uh, uh, what uh, Wes Mitchell said because I would uh, sign almost everything uh, what uh, uh, he told us uh, since uh, we are saying almost the same but uh, with uh, different words uh, for a long time now. I also think that uh, we are a difficult nation to deal with uh, from the outside point of view. Because uh, from time to time, uh, it seems to me that uh, we are still not a grown-up nation, that we are still um, uh, quite often behaving uh, like a spoiled child, or like a difficult teenager, where we uh, do something uh, one day and do something else another day, or saying one word uh, today and another word tomorrow. So uh, quite often we are very inconsistent in uh, uh, the perceptions from, from, from outside. Uh, when uh, I am to keep uh, the topic of uh, today's discussion, which is uh, U.S.-Czech uh, relationship, uh, specifically in hard power and more specifically in military, I would uh, quite shortly say that uh, it's fine and there is almost no nothing to improve here. But of course it would be too short and too, uh, too uh, <laughs> simplistic. Um, our relationship with uh, the U.S. Uh, in what uh, is called hard power goes uh, far uh, beyond or prior to our NATO accession in uh, 1999. Uh, 
Uh, when uh, we talk about uh, hard power, we uh, usually think uh, about military, uh, specifically in, Ch in uh, case of Czech Republic. Uh, uh, it's quite difficult to uh, talk about hard power, not uh, from the reasons with, which uh, Wes mentioned in the beginning, but also uh, from the reason that uh, our military, in fact, d doesn't have too much hard power. We are at the softer edge of uh, the hard power. Uh, because of the size, uh, all the reductions, uh, and also because of uh, um, problems of uh, funding, which uh, then uh, results into uh, uh, the status of uh, and amount of our equipment. But nevertheless, uh, we uh, have uh, quite uh, extensive contacts with uh, the U.S. And I have to say that uh, I'm probably one of uh, uh, the very first examples of that cooperation because uh, I was uh, one of the first officers uh, who participated in uh, international military uh, uh, training in Washington DC in early 92 where uh, we were not uh, still so far mentally from Warsaw Pact and uh, I was uh, thrown up directly to the very heart of uh, the other side uh, to uh, Washington DC to Bowling Air Force Base uh, to uh, the center of military intelligence service. It was quite a uh, quite sharp step. And since then uh, we had a lot of uh, different contacts and um, I have to mention another one. Uh, prior to our accession it was in 97 uh, still a uh, PFP uh, country where we started our cooperation uh, between special forces where uh, we had the first uh, visit of uh, U.S. Navy SEALs uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Prosyov, where we uh, started a very fruitful cooperation, which uh, lasts uh, up to now and uh, brought us uh, quite a lot of experience and uh, uh, opened us new horizons. Uh, we uh, were, since our accession, uh, part uh, of uh, many different uh, formats of cooperation, including uh, training and education uh, where quite a large number of our uh, officers and NCOs uh, attend uh, different courses uh, in the US. We also have a lot of uh, training opportunities uh, where we train uh, now at all levels uh, many times a year. We have uh, right at this moment uh, US troops on our soil uh, in uh, our, one of our uh, air bases in Namnest where uh, we train together with uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Army helicopters uh, uh, joint training uh, in favor of uh, joint uh, tactical air controllers. Um, we, uh, we, uh, at the same time, uh, we are now training uh, with other U.S. forces uh, in Hohenfels in Germany, uh, where we have a full battalion uh, every year uh, for joint training. and. Uh, I have to say that uh, in that area uh, we truly don't have um, any barriers between, uh, between uh, the two militaries, even though there is a huge uh, difference in um, size and scale. Uh, uh, but uh, otherwise in procedures, uh, in um, standards, uh, we are now at a very comparable level. And I truly believe that it's not only uh, polite behavior of our uh, U.S. colleagues uh, who keep saying that uh, uh, they uh, really uh, take us as uh, serious partners for any operation. And I have a specific uh, a word for that, uh, that uh, when uh, you let someone to cover your back, you have to rely on him as you would rely on yourself. And that's uh, especially true in uh, combat situations in Afghanistan where we uh, were fighting uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder many times. And uh, when uh, our soldiers uh, were well covered by U.S. and vice versa. So this is uh, the type of relationship uh, built in combat which uh, really goes uh, beyond words and beyond uh, all, every strategy. I should also mention uh, Another area uh, of, uh, of uh, cooperation uh, and its uh, uh, future cooperation, mostly conceptual uh, as well as uh, practical, uh, it was uh, part of uh, the outcomes of the summit in, in Wales, 
where uh, we have agreed on a creation of uh, an, an element within uh, an RF uh, with, with higher level of uh, readiness, uh, where um, we fully understand uh, the meaning of it and uh, we are ready to uh, contribute to uh, this element with a credible and uh, prepared uh, force. Uh, depending on the uh, force generation process and planning, uh, planning uh, plans uh, from, from shape. Uh, we uh, will also be happy to be part of uh, any measures which uh, would be taken against uh, uh, Islamic uh, extremism in uh, Iraq and uh, Syria because uh, we, in our perception, uh, think that uh, this threat is uh, not less than, uh, than uh, the threat from, uh, from Russia uh, in uh, the east from our borders, but uh, potentially in future it uh, could be even uh, more dangerous uh, than uh, the threat from Russia. Uh, Russia and, uh, and uh, our uh, part of the world uh, will be threatened by this extremism in the same way. So eventually we could uh, probably find the same language uh, on how to face together this, uh, this uh, uh, threat uh, and uh, as it was uh, in the past many times, wherever you want to put two enemies together, give them another common enemy and uh, uh, we, we have it now. So um, I'm not arguing uh, against any measures uh, to uh, face uh, the threat posed by Russia, uh, uh, not at all, but uh, I'm also arguing uh, that uh, there is uh, potentially at uh, the horizon uh, some topic uh, which uh, we can discuss together and use as a vehicle how to uh, reopen, re reopen the door which uh, now is uh, almost closed. So in, in summary uh, I see uh, the relationship between uh, US and Czech military uh, in uh, what uh, is called hard power as uh, going very well with a uh, good potential for future. Hopefully now when uh, uh, this government uh, keep, keeps uh, its promise uh, on uh, increasing defense budget. We'll be able to put in practice all the plans uh, we have uh, for uh, future acquisitions and uh, training, and uh, we will uh, stay a uh, reliable partner, not only to the U.S., but to the whole NATO. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, General, for adding uh, some practical military flesh to the debate. And before I, uh, I open the debate, uh, uh, I would like to give Wes uh, the opportunity to perhaps react briefly to what the other panelists uh, have said. Sure, I'll just be very brief. Um, Daniel, it's great to see you again. <coughs> Daniel and I agree on everything that he has said. Um, my argument is not that Czech security policy or military has been ineffective or faulty in any way. It's simply that you have developed the tools that were required for your environment and that that environment is shifting. Um, Czech soldiers are some of the finest uh, allies that the United States have. Uh, I mean, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, I think altogether in the last decade or so the, or more, there's been something like 37 different international deployments of the Czech military. Uh, highly trained, professional. I, I've talked to a lot of the American soldiers who have served alongside them in Afghanistan. You're spending increases of moving up to 1.4% set a very positive example for the rest of the alliance, cooperation on missile defense. My argument is simply broader. And it applies not only to the behavior of small frontline states, it applies first and foremost to my own country. I mean, there's a huge debate underway in Washington about how we readjust strategically to deal with a multi-competitor environment in the 21st century. Everything we know about extended deterrence in US strategy is in fairly advanced stages of decay, and I think we've made it worse no offense, John, but I think the current administration has made it measurably worse for U.S. allies in the Middle East, in East Asia, and in Central and Eastern Europe. So I think we have our work to do. I think you have your work to do. I think the entire game board is shifting. So, Thank you very much. Now we have uh, approximately 25 minutes uh, for debate. Uh, uh, I would, ask, I would like to ask you to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to ask your questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please uh, stand up, wait for the walking mic, uh, identify yourself and uh, be, be brief in uh, asking your question. Iri Schneider was first. I have uh, uh, two related questions. 
uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in Wales, uh, uh, the debate was, or the decision was, not only about the increase of the overall budget, but uh, uh, there is a commitment to increase considerably uh, the share of R&D within the defence budget, uh, uh, which uh, I think is a big challenge and big opportunity. Uh, also for the Czech-US uh, cooperation in this, in this area. Of course, it would require some specialization. So I would like to hear your comments, whether you see this uh, uh, as the opportunity. The second question is, uh, uh, Wes uh, has uh, uh, talked about the consequence of uh, Ukraine-Russian conflict. Uh, in doctrinal terms, strategic doctrine, we have to adapt to the new situation. But isn't there a consequence for uh, modernization of uh, speeding up uh, of modernization of platforms? Because so far, uh, we've been able to interoperate uh, even between various platforms, inclu including Russian-based platforms. But isn't now the time to speed up getting rid of Russian-based platform among allies? So I would like to hear your comments. I mean, in our case, uh, I, I view it especially in the area of helicopters, but uh, I mean, maybe there are some other uh, areas. Would you, would you kindly comment on these two questions? Okay, thank you very much. So we have two questions. I suggest that uh, uh, you two share uh, answering uh, the first question and the second question was specifically aimed at Wes. So please, please go ahead, Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, in, uh, yes, the summit there was a decision that we should spend, then allocate money from the defense budget. The 20% of money should be invested in acquisitions, modernization, so in simply invested, not, not, not mandatory expenditures and so on. We are now slightly more than 10%. Uh, that's uh, simple mathematics because if the, there is only 1% GDP for as defense budget, then Mandatory, mandatory expenditures are growing and investments are going down. If we would have 2% as we had in 1999, it was exactly 20%. Um, but there is complication from my point of view because our uh, defense industry companies are 99% private. They many times focus on fighting Ministry of Defense than cooperating with Ministry of Defense. Uh, so to convince them to cooperate with American companies on some R&D, we would have benefit, and the United States military would have benefit, is quite difficult, and do it through Ministry of Defense or state companies established by Ministry of Defense is also uh, possible, but uh, many times difficult because uh, it's quite narrow uh, focus for those state companies and uh, they are more focused on, uh, let's say, hard stuff like uh, uh, like uh, armored personal carriers or let's say helicopters. So it's not much about new technologies or, or something. And we would have to invest and if the Ministry of Defense was underfinanced, then it was very difficult to find uh, investments for R&D and Czech companies were not much able to see beyond, beyond the horizon of the Czech Republic. So I think what we are trying to do is to talk to companies augment the budget to be able to let state companies uh, invest as well and uh, uh, help them to diversify the portfolio of what they are doing and, uh, and, uh, and also strengthen the dialogue with the United States on this or maybe generally NATO because that's always a problem that people don't know with whom, what, when, where. Well, uh very short comment on uh, proportion of the budget. Uh, once uh, your budget is uh, distorted as, as ours, uh, which means we are now at almost 60% of mandatory expenditures, uh, slightly over 30% of uh, running cost, and then uh, not even 11% for investments. Uh, and you try to, uh, to uh, put it right, uh, it's difficult to do it in a short, in a short time because uh, it wouldn't make sense if we now uh, 20% into investments where we wouldn't have enough personnel uh, training. So it has to uh, go in, in, in balance. Of course, uh, it uh, takes uh, some time with all the shortages uh, we have in uh, military 
Um, it's, uh, and if we are to keep uh, our commitments, uh, what uh, we have to do and we are striving for, uh, we really have to uh, consider very carefully uh, at what pace we will increase uh, uh, different uh, pillars of, uh, of the budget. So we are working on that. Uh, as for the modernization or a replacement of um, Russian-based uh, equipment, it's our concern for a long time. And uh, we have made uh, several analyses how uh, to overcome uh, that uh, risk. Uh, and uh, right uh, today, uh, we discussed possible replacement of helicopters. Uh, one of uh, the options, uh, which is still open, it's um, not uh, going through open tender, but uh, under uh, the cir circumstances to go directly to uh, one, one company, which uh, would make uh, such a contract much, much shorter. Of course, uh, such an uh, investment uh, will uh, be quite significant, so uh, it uh, has to be spread uh, over several years anyway, uh, which would put us under risk uh, in the worst case scenario we may end up for some time uh, without uh, some capability linked to this equipment, especially to helicopters. Wes? Uh, Yuri, thanks for the question. I think there's a very strong case for accelerating the modernization process in the Czech military. First of all, it's a strategic case for it. Um, your environment, as I've argued, is fluid and not static. The Russians are spending $700 billion which is about the size of the, of the entire U.S. defense budget on modernization over the next decade. Their capabilities are improving. The Russian army in Ukraine was not the Russian army that we saw in Georgia. I think there's an interoperability case for it um, that links to the, the A2AD point that I made about the kind of assets that you'll need for territorial defense. And I think that there's a, U a Ukraine-specific case for it. That One thing I overlooked in my, my comments is the case for NATO states, and certainly Central European states, to, to help provide lethal and non-lethal aid to the Ukrainian military. And there's a win-win uh, situation here. With, you know, if, if we could have a rollover of some kind, the Ukrainians, one of the biggest problems for Ukrainian forces in the field is that their Soviet-era equipment is breaking down and they have no replacement parts because they've traditionally relied on Russia for those parts. Central Europe has some of the largest uh, warehouses and uh, uh, arsenals of Soviet era equipment in the world that they want to get rid of. The United States has a large amount of, of platforms that Central Europeans want to um, upgrade to, and it's true of Western European countries as well. So the obvious win-win scenario would be some sort of conveyor belt or rollover. I think in this particular case, that's something that the United States needs to be more actively involved in and promoting so that it could work for the Czech Republic. Thank you. Uh, Sasha Vondra. Milena Jaburková, sorry, sorry. IBM. Okay. Uh, as a citizen, Milena Jaburková, I'm really frustrated with the political debate which is, which is going on regarding uh, the current crisis. So this panel is a sort of therapy for me. Thank you for that, guys. And now to the question, uh, how uh, NATO initiatives like uh, uh, intelligent reconnaissance, surveillance, uh, smart defense, uh, and others can help you, cybersecurity uh, can help you in this new uh, uh, sort of mode of war Wes was describing. Thank you very much for the question. Of course, what we see uh, used by the Russians in Ukraine and what uh, NATO calls hybrid warfare uh, is a complex uh, complex uh, uh, set of tools, including some really innovative approaches like uh, uh, propaganda using social, uh, social networks and uh, massive uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, disinformation operations and so on. So th thanks for the question. Uh, Wes? Sure. I mean, I, my perspective on that, I'm sure Daniel has a, a more educated perspective, but I was actually very pleased with the NATO summit for the first part. I, you know, I think NATO uh, didn't do some things that are desperately needed if we're going to handle this, this new environment. I mean, one of them is uh, pre-approval for the use of the spearhead force. I mean, it does very little for us if, uh, you know, against Crimea-style threats, a permanent basing, which the Poles desperately need, uh, and no real planning for preclusive defense. But I, I would agree with Jan that I think NATO has a role on a, a broader array of, perspect of, of issues, cyber, propaganda, energy, intelligence, um, in all of those areas, NATO has been in what could be called a state of war with Russia for a very long time. 
uh, and we're losing, largely because of lack of preparation, lack of solidarity in the alliance. So I think NATO is, is underperforming in its role in some of those areas and has a huge role to play it in the solution. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, history of NATO is actually a constant try by the United States to push Europeans to spend more. You know, so all those initiatives are actually uh, being invented in years to push Europeans to spend more. Um, so smart defense, whatever, uh, it's actually how to, how to do it when, when either smaller nations can't by definition have its own something strategic, uh, drone or something, uh, how to put resources together and have it for NATO, a full group of uh, countries, or how if there is some underfinanced approach, uh, some, some budget cuts, then how to at least with what we have uh, do the best performance in terms of producing uh, defense capabilities. Because, and, and it's true that, so it's not about spend less and have more. It's about spend what we have and hopefully spend more, but get the biggest possible uh, um, uh, product or, or, or efficiency in terms of defense capabilities. Uh, and two is that uh, we are still um, uh, hugely inefficient in terms of the cooperation inside NATO. Uh, part of the problem is that traditionally the military is the most conservative part of the any administration. It's a question of sovereignty, it's a question of also domestic defense industries and so on and so on. But if you look at even V4 countries, for example, the, the, the issue of artillery or anything else, the, the, that we each have different platforms, so we can't have joint logistics or much better joint logistics than if having uh, joint platforms or the same platforms with different variations. This is something we are trying to work on very hard with Poles and others uh, to really be able to coordinate acquisition, if not joint acquisition steps, then to acquire the same things, to have ability to have joint uh, training, joint logistics, joint uh, um, uh, deployment then is much better because if you have one type of helicopter, one type of artillery, then even fighting is easier because uh, soldiers can can simply share the, the equipment uh, without any problems and, and ammunition is the same then and everything. So it's incredible how, how, how bad it is in NATO, not only in V4 but generally. Uh, but that's that's you know, as I said, uh, partially because of the traditional conservatism, vested interests of different uh, uh, defense industries and governments and political parties and so on. So it's understandable because they are defending their interests. But I think the, the last five years uh, have shown that uh, it's worth try to overcome some of those deficiencies in terms of the cooperation. And, uh, and hopefully we will produce some, some uh, um, um, in a foreseeable future, some tangible results, at least in the Visegrad group. So, thank you. Okay, Sasha Vondra. Well, uh, one comment and two questions to, to the speaker. First, the comment I was asked by Daniel to say also a few words on, on the uh, defense spending. I would not say that the United States were always uh, in the last 15 or 20 years uh, asking Europe uh, to spend more. They were asking to engage more. And uh, it's not necessarily the same. In fact, although this defense spending, not just the Czech defense spending, but most of all European countries' defense spending in the relative term was declining in the last 10 years. The real noise uh, from, uh, from uh, Washington came in 2000, I think 11 or 12, when Bill Gates, leaving as a Secretary of Defense, made this famous statement. Before that, we were asked to engage more, uh, for example, to send more troops to Afghanistan. And in fact, 
nobody in Washington has criticized us because of the defense spending, uh, I would say, until 2012. The change has come with the change of the NATO and, I would say, U.S. priorities. This tendency to go home, uh, to end this expeditionary mission, that was uh, the change of the mood and the atmosphere. Before that, the transatlantic bargain was that, you know, you should help, uh, we will continue to guarantee for the security of Europe in exchange that you Europeans will help us uh, to guarantee the stability in the world. Otherwise, you will go as and will raise your flags in Iraq, Afghanistan and elsewhere. So, and because here the Czechs were performing very well, and in fact we have even increased in Afghanistan in 2011, so nobody has criticized us even in that particular year when uh, Bill Gates was, uh, 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 William Gates was, was drumming on the drums. And one more, you know, I um, remember very well that Bruce Jackson is already out. In 2000, or 1999, 2000, when we were already the fresh members of NATO, I had a verbal conflict with him in Washington because he, as a man who was still maybe, I think he was still working as a vice president for Lockheed, his argument was, forget about supersonic. You do not need them. We need you, <laughs> uh, you know, on the ground. My contra-argument is that, you know, Czechs will not be only in the ground. You know, that's, I, you know, we are not the slaves. We are also the equal partners. We will never give up that kind of a capability. So just, you know, to commemorate those forgotten, uh, forgotten things, uh, George Robertson, in fact, uh, had the same argument. And the questions, uh, first, you know, because we are talking about the Czech budget, but uh, we should also look at the U.S. Uh, defense budget. So. You know, there was this sequestration uh, disastrous plan. And now we saw the outlook uh, by Vladimir Dlouhi with the prospect of uh, U.S. economy booming, you know, 3-4% growth in the next couple of five years. So my question to Wes is whether we can expect also some re-evaluation on the U.S. side because, you know, one of the sad differences that the when the Czechs are making the cuts, they are making the cuts on the basis of accounting, so they are cutting this from one year to another. While if the British or uh, US or other countries with a developed defense planning, so if they are announcing the cuts, it means that they are reducing uh, the growth in the next 10 years. So uh, where we are with that, and to the Czechs, uh, the, 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 the second question, uh, as this consequence of the, of the, of the uh, summit in Wales and the debate about either extending some NATO infrastructure with an ability to accept those rapid reaction forces to enforce uh, the defense on the eastern flank, uh, as well as, you know, now forget about the, you know, this political talks, but if, if it is a wish, on the wish list of the uh, Czech armed forces, would you have to wish to enforce, uh, to make the Czech defense in this era of going home and enforcing uh, the posture on the east, uh, eastern flank, what you would be opting for? Just one area where you feel uh, we need to upgrade our ability the, uh, to, to, to get the defense stronger and to accept uh, uh, the rapid reaction forces from outside. I think one positive unintended consequence of global geopolitical turbulence, so in so many places simultaneously, ISIS, up Syria, what's happening in Ukraine, um, the friction points in the South China Sea, I think that it's gradually creating a new political consensus in the United States to reevaluate the cuts. And you see one litmus test of that in the most, in the greatest budget hawks in the Tea Party movement of the Republicans. If you look at what some of their Senate candidates are running on, to my shock, it's foreign policy. They're criticizing the president for being too lax on foreign policy. 
um, not fighting our main threats and not spending enough. So I would use that wing of the Republican Party as a, a bellwether for, and the comments and, and activities of a lot of uh, Senate uh, Democrats as well. So I, I think what we've had is a lethal combination of cutting into the muscle tissue of American defense capabilities at exactly the moment when we're showing strategic drift. And if I were a, a strategic competitor of the United States that was gaining an economic strength like the chart showed with China earlier, I would see a very permissive environment for opportunistic revisionism. And if I were a Russia that is in long-term decline but has some asymmetric power advantages in the near term, I would see it as an irresistible moment to move on Ukraine or Transnistria or Moldova or a Baltic state or in the Black Sea. You're not going to get a more permissive environment. And I think what's changing is that the the simultaneous costs of U.S. withdrawal and disengagement are forcing a rethink in the United States. And I think the irony is part of the investment thesis politically for the Obama administration in those cuts has been to have a kind of retrenchment dividend. And it's almost like trying to get a, a, the, the dividend from our victory in the Cold War 25 years too late and spend it on social programs at a moment when multiple very capable challengers are becoming stronger in their relative power positions in the United States. So I, I think... I think it's a, a very dangerous moment in global geopolitics, and I think you'll see the American political consensus start to shift towards reversing some of the sequestration. Either that or we give up some global stability. Wish list. He leaves it to me. Wish list. No, uh, I wouldn't say that we have a specific uh, wish uh, for uh, that uh, future capability because uh, the only thing I would wish to our military were uh, we were able uh, to provide all the capability from our own budget, not to ask for, uh, for, for it from the outside. Because if uh, we really uh, go uh, closer to this uh, promised figure 1.4 percent of GDP, or even uh, a little bit higher, I, I'm sure that uh, we would be able not only to keep uh, the numbers of personnel at uh, the required level, but also uh, to uh, come to 20% on modernization, uh, which would uh, um, keep us uh, at the same uh, pace of modernization uh, with our partners so that uh, there is no, no, no gap in technology and tactics. Uh, on the other hand, uh, to accept uh, reinforcement from NATO, uh, we uh, have all the measures within host nation support developed. Uh, we just uh, uh, verified now uh, one of them uh, in uh, Namnish, which I already mentioned, uh, where uh, we are ready to accept up to two squadrons uh, of um, any NATO nation uh, Air Force, uh, including all the lodging and facilities. And it's working, and uh, our colleagues, not only from the U.S. and from other countries, were uh, very happy with the arrangement. So I think with, with, within this area, we are able to accept uh, reinforcement. On our own, own side, I would uh, go for um, uh, improving our own resources. Well, uh, just to quickly add, uh, I would be more specific. I would like to see slightly more planes, slight uh, more pandurs, because we have only half of we need, uh, and uh, and artillery and things. It means ground forces, and I would like to see much more ammunition. Because the, that's what decides today's wars. If you, if we have or don't have ammunition, that was deciding basically even the latest choose between Israel and Hamas. Israel was prone for to prone to accept the to go for kind of a choose because it was running out of the ammunition for Iron Dome. Okay, I think you forgot about helicopters uh, on the wish list. That's uh, a crucial item as well. Okay. I wouldn't say this is a wish list because uh, the, uh, all of what uh, has been mentioned is already within our structure. We, we only have to, um, have to fulfill it and it needs resources. So once uh, resources are here, this uh, all will be uh, functional and ready for use. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Glenn, and I'm afraid this will be our last question. Thank you. I'll try to be brief then. Uh, so I have two questions for Wes that I want to raise and one for Daniel, if I may, with appreciation for a very thoughtful panel. So Wes, you know, you and I have talked about whether or not this notion that, I'll take you, this administration has made it worse, presumes that it was better 
before. And I would like to suggest that the past two administrations have been struggling with what to do since 9-11, 13 years ago, and that the alarming move by the last administration not to accept an Article 5 guarantee, but to go outside of NATO when they went into Afghanistan, was the first sign of the challenge of the allies that you're talking about. And the question for you is, how do you explain the challenge of the lack of deterrence for Putin in Georgia in 2008? Is it that different? I think in simple fact, the US was bogged down in two wars at that time, and it was an, a guess that they were unable to be able to respond that way. We neither deterred nor changed the situation on the ground. And so if that's true, I don't, it's the contrast I'm asking for. But secondly, now, because I was so, in, you gave a great presentation for me up until then. <laughs> I really want to know, how concerned are you about the Article 5 guarantee right now to the Baltics? Now, I understand that Putin might be, as you said, opportunistic. How far can I go? Can I attack the Baltics, even though they're a member of NATO? But it's somehow, I guess maybe I'm wondering if I have more confidence in that than you do, or if you're really, really, I really mean, are you scared that he would really attack Estonia? Even if, again, your presentation was terrific, he could go in and occupy a piece of Lithuania faster than we could stop. But my guess is there would be force coming in to get them out of Lithuania very fast, and that the problem of Ukraine is that they're not a NATO member, and we don't have an Article 5 guarantee, and it makes it very hard. So two questions, Georgia, and, uh, and as it were, Article 5 there. Mr. Kosovo, I really enjoyed the two. The interesting contrast for me was that um, General Pavel's presentation was all about working with American troops through NATO. And your presentation struck me as a bilateral one about we only have as many aircraft, less than an aircraft carrier is our Air Force. Now that may be inevitable when you work for a national government, but is most of your experience in this a bilateral one? Or what place does NATO play in your experience of U.S. Czech military hard power? Because it seems to me that that's the only logical context is through NATO. But I'd be interested more in your thoughts. Well, thank you very much. Uh, if I uh, can dare to interpret your first question, it is about who is the bigger appeaser, Bush or Obama? Okay, please, Wes. <laughs> John, John, John. Come on, Wes. Come on. I say, let's, let's start with the reset. Um, <laughs> so look, no, let's, let's actually start with the reset because I think it, it does get to the heart of the problem. Let me just give you one example of, of what, what I think has really been lethal about US policy in this region of the last several years, that I think Ukraine highlights this irony. Not only have we had our own farcical, unilateral investment of goodwill in an anti-Western, revisionist, authoritarian regime, We've asked Central European allies to have their own resets. The number of conversations that I've had with loyal Central European allies who have been there for us in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they say, look, the, you know, Putin has issued military threats, he's um, undermining our systems at home, the propaganda, and your administration is asking us to carry the football over into Moscow and have our own positive change of relations. And then Ukraine comes along, and within the a course of a couple of months, to their credit, the Obama administration responded by necessity and only by necessity, and suddenly we're singing from a completely different play, play, playbook or uh, songbook. So we go to the Central European countries that we've been asking to have a detente with Russia, and we say, no, forget about that. We were wrong about Russia, and we were wrong about what we asked you to do. We're going to change policy course. You need to change policy course. And you know what? I'm not surprised that countries in this region or in Europe in general don't want to, to support us on sanctions. Why would they? Um, Something Bruce said earlier, I, I agree with. If, if you're going to be the hegemon of the international system, you can't afford to not show predictability. Um, let me just say a word about Bush versus Obama. You're making a valid point. There were a lot of flaws under the Bush administration. On Central Europe specifically, I'm getting really animated. Um, on Central Europe specifically, remember what the baseline problem was under the Bush administration. It was that we over-transactionalized the relationship. It was not a foundational doubt about whether the United States was committed to the security of the region. It's that the nature, the transactional nature of the relationship after Iraq and Afghanistan. We broke the back of the quad. I mean, we, we invested very deeply in the political relationships of this region. So I think, it's, I think you're comparing something different. I think the erosion under Obama has been fundamental. It's about whether we are committed to this region and to providing for its security, or whether we would prefer to, to talk to the Russians over the head of Central Europeans. Um, Georgia, I think, is the best question that you asked. Um, I think 
I think Putin is an opportunistic revisionist. He gets different opportunities in different environments. He has bigger opportunities in this environment. Under the Bush administration, remember, number one, it was at the very tail end of the Bush administration. Number two, yes, we were distracted in the Middle East. Um, remember that the Russians in Georgia backed down within the first few days because of American pressure, because we flew Georgian troops from Iraq back into Georgia and made it clear that we were going to land the aircraft whether the Russians wanted them landed or not. There was a very tense standoff. Um, I would also say that Ukraine is not Georgia. Ukraine, the level of ambition involved suggests that Vladimir Putin sees a very permissive environment, and I think he's using that to the max. Article 5 guarantee to the Balts, I think out of their own mouths if you talk to them. Right now, my concern is not so much that, Ar that Article 5 it lacks credibility in some theological sense. It's that by the time we would need it, it, it would be too late. I mean, the Russians kidnapped an Estonian military officer last week from Estonian territory and took him back into Russia and put him in, in, a, in prison. And this happened within 48 hours of our commander-in-chief making a speech in Tallinn about how committed we were to the Estonians. I think the Russians already are signaling that they don't in any way respect NATO's commitment to Article 5. My biggest concern about limited war is that if the Russians moved into Lithuania overnight, if it's like the Crimea situation, the slow mechanisms of NATO and the political divisions of NATO mean that even if Article 4 or Article 5 were evoked, by the time the alliance did something, the Russians will have created a territorial fait accompli, say a land corridor in, between Belarus and Kaliningrad, and it will be up to NATO to militarily evict them. And I don't know a Germany that's going to support that kind of military force. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I, I actually understood the question. Is it like why I'm so sober about the Czech military and, and uh, in comparison to U.S. military or what? what? Well, my, that's maybe because I'm taking NATO uh, too much as something natural already for our defense strategy and everything. So it's only natural if I'm speaking about something that's in the context of NATO. It can't be otherwise in Czech, in Czech case. It can be the case in the US case uh, to speak about something uh, outside of NATO and still speaking about defense or whatever. So that's that's the that's the issue. I think my background is I started my foreign postments in our mission to NATO. So so it's uh, it's all, for us all here Czechs. So I think it's very natural to think. Actually, we one can say that uh, we are we believe more in NATO than than many other nations. You know, uh, it's for us it's. Uh, it's a must because otherwise it would change totally, qualitatively everything and we, have, we, we had in the 90s before entering the NATO the, the ideas like defense from all directions you know you can't build such a credible defense in country like Czech Republic for all directions it's simply everything around you is too big in, when compared to your resources. So NATO is for us kind of a must, so that's why we try to do our best to, to, make, to keep NATO credible. If I may, I would be a little bit more skeptical about the uh, general support and acceptance of NATO by our society because we are uh, quite mixed in that view. Uh, the support to NATO membership is about 50%. It's quite constant. But uh, I'm not sure if uh, this 50% uh, uh, which is for NATO uh, fully understands what does it mean because uh, quite a large portion of our population uh, thought uh, uh, the very existence of Czech military as the entry ticket to NATO. Once we got in, we don't need it anymore because we think that NATO in itself will, will, will protect us. Uh, and that's uh, the, the understanding, the perception of, of what does it mean to be a NATO member, including respect to values and commitments. That's what, uh, what we really need to understand. I think there is uh, quite a lot of work to be done here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
just to conclude, I, well, sorry, uh, we are well behind uh, uh, the schedule, sorry. Uh, and just very briefly to conclude, uh, uh, this is not an isolated event. We are very grateful to Wes and to uh, Sasha, actually, for organizing this event, because actually it fits nicely into what we are doing with the Americans at this time of the year in particular. Uh, you may know that actually, as we speak, there is a major uh, uh, life exercise going on uh, in the Czech Republic called Ample Strike with a heavy US uh, uh, participation. Uh, next week, uh, we at the Defense Ministry host what we call the High uh, Level Defense Group, uh, which means that people from the Pentagon are coming to the Czech Republic to talk with us uh, about some, you know, uh, about a, a, a broad range of uh, uh, defense issues uh, related to Czech uh, US cooperation. And at the end of next week, uh, we as the Czech Republic uh, host uh, a meeting of uh, NATO defense policy directors, uh, who are people actually like myself, I am the host, and actually the event or the, uh, the meeting will be co-chaired by uh, NATO Deputy Secretary General uh, Sandy Verzbo. So uh, a lot of events going on, and of course we in the government need uh, universities and think tanks to support us. That's uh, what we hope for. So please uh, go ahead and uh, speak loudly in public and uh, write a lot, Sasha. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it, it, it has been an excellent debate. We, uh, our panelists, with the help of your questions, uh, touched uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the very profound questions uh, in this area. Uh, so please join me in applauding them.